Hello everyone, in this video we will take a first look at a trigonometric functions uh, which will of course be with us for the remainder of the term. We will first review the Pythagorean theorem and the distance formula which are going to be necessary in order for us to define the trigonometric functions of uh, both non-quadrantal as well as quadrantal angles. The Pythagorean theorem, of course, uh, we are all familiar with from uh, previous work and uh, normally you may be used to seeing the Pythagorean theorem using the letters A, B, and C in this manner, right? Now, the reason I like to get away from that uh, habit is the fact that sometimes uh, students get too attached to those letters and of course if I draw a right triangle in this manner then clearly for that triangle a squared plus b squared is not equal to c squared in that triangle the correct uh, Pythagorean statement would be that b squared plus c squared equals a squared. So in order not to fall for this error and attachment to the letters a, b, and c, it's safer if we talk about the two legs of a right triangle, which are the two sides that form the right angle. And the side opposite the right angle we call the hypotenuse, right? So it's a lot safer if you remember the Pythagorean theorem as the square of the first leg plus the square of the second leg equals the square of the hypotenuse or the sum of the squares of the two legs equals the square of the hypotenuse. So that's a, a safer way to remember it. One of the most useful applications of the Pythagorean theorem, of course, remains the distance formula. Uh, imagine you have two points in the plane, uh, points uh, P1 with coordinates X1, Y1 and P2 with coordinates X2, Y2 and also suppose we want to find the distance between those two points in the plane. Here we're using the Cartesian coordinate plane which uh, provides a fantastic way of organizing all that information. Notice that if this is the point P, uh, x1, y1, that means the x coordinate here is x1 and the y coordinate here is y1. And if this is the point x2, y2 here, that means this x coordinate is x2 and the y coordinate here is y2. And also notice that the distance here between x1 and x2 as is the case with any smaller number and a larger number along the number line is just going to be the larger number minus the smaller number so x2 minus x1 right and the same goes here for this vertical distance that's y2 minus y1 right for example if this is 7 and that's 2 we know that that length is going to be 5 so not a big uh, secret here now the interesting thing is that there is this natural right triangle that you can form when you're dealing with two points uh, like that in the plane, two distinct points of course, and in that right triangle the legs have length precisely the same as that length x2 minus x1 and also this length which as we recall is y2 minus y1. So if we write the Pythagorean equation for this right triangle, notice we get hypotenuse squared equals the sum of the squares of the two legs, which are of course, remember this leg's length is x2 minus x1 and this leg's length is y2 minus y1. So we end up with this, but we want the distance, not the square of the distance. So we take the, you know, we apply basically the square root property rather than take the square root of both sides uh, then uh, we get d equals we actually end up with plus or minus the square root of uh, this uh, expression except that the negative will be rejected because distance is never negative so um, we are indeed applying the square root property here which says 
if x squared equals k, that implies x equals plus or minus the square root of k. And we call this the square root property. All right, so using uh, the Pythagorean theorem, uh, we found a formula that will give us the distance between any two points in a plane. Now go ahead and let P of XY be any point other than the origin on the terminal side of some angle theta as depicted here. Now, notice that theta may be a first quadrant angle, meaning it has a terminal side in the first quadrant, or it could be a second quadrant angle, such as the one depicted here. Makes no difference. Um, what we uh, like to do is we'd like to find the distance between uh, the point uh, P of X, Y and the origin. And of course we can do that using the Pythagorean theorem because we know that if this is P of X, Y, then we can use X here for this distance and Y for that distance, right? Notice that in this case, X would be uh, negative because of the location. However, it makes no difference because uh, once we go ahead and square, we're going to end up with um, x squared uh, regardless. So in either case, we end up with r equals the square root of x minus 0 squared plus quantity y minus 0 squared. And of course, x minus 0 is just x and y minus 0 is just y. So we end up with r equals the square root of x squared plus y squared. That is a, a distance that is always referred to using the letter r. We are now ready to go ahead and define the six trigonometric functions of theta, which are nothing but some very useful ratios. That's all they are. So recall this uh, image from the previous screen. So we have this angle theta. I've you know, chosen the one that ends in the first quadrant just for simplicity. Otherwise, it will work with any uh, angle with a terminal side in any of the quadrants. So the way that we define the six trigonometric functions are as follows. We call the sine of theta, we write it like this, it's as uh, the ratio of the si this side right here, which is the y coordinate of the point divided by that distance, which we just found on the previous screen, which is the distance between the point on the terminal side of theta and the origin. So we get sine of theta equals y over r. The cosine of theta we define as x over r, tangent of theta y over x, the cosecant of theta as r over y, notice it's the reciprocal of the sine of theta. The secant of theta we define as r over x and the cotangent as x over y. Now, notice that since r is always a positive quantity because it's a distance, right? Now, X and Y may be positive or negative, but not R. R is always positive, right? And it's never zero. So because of that, these two quantities are always well-defined, right? Because you only get in trouble with fractions if the denominator is zero. And since R is always positive, it can't be zero. So these two functions are well-defined for all uh, uh, angles theta, uh, which we can um, conceive of. Now, the tangent of uh, theta, however, notice it has a variable in the denominator which could become zero. In other words, you could pick a point for which the x coordinate is zero, such as a point on the y axis, right? So because uh, of that, we have to make the restriction that says for x not equal to zero. Tangent of theta is undefined when x equals zero. And uh, here, of course, sin we pronounce as sine theta. This, this function we pronounce as cosine theta. This one, tangent theta, cosecant theta, secant theta, and cotangent theta. 
Notice that cosecant, secant, and cotangent are also going to have restrictions. For cosecant, we don't want y to be 0, so for y not equal to 0. And we know that cosecant is going to be undefined when y is 0. Secant, uh, we don't want x to be 0 again, because if it is, this becomes undefined. And for cotangent, we don't want the y value to, or coordinate of the point to be 0, because otherwise it will be undefined. You may recall some shortcuts, you know, from um, high school trigonometry with Sokatoa, you know, etc. And we'll get to all that, but right now we're doing a more pure uh, uh, rendition of the trigonometric function based solely uh, on a point that is on the terminal side of the angle theta. We're not dealing with any kind of specific uh, triangles like we did back in high school trigonometry, but that kind of uh, rendition will also come later. For our first example, we're going to sketch an angle theta in standard position whose terminal side passes through the point 5, negative 12, and then we're going to use that sketch to find the exact values of the six trigonometric functions of theta. Now, I've used Desmos to help me plot this uh, because it'll look much better than what I would do by hand, but it's very simple to do by hand and for all practical purposes we are doing this by hand. So we still need to indicate where theta is. Notice because theta is in standard position the positive x-axis will be the initial side. So we start rotating like this. So there is the angle theta and the point uh, on the terminal side of interest to us is 5 negative 12 the triangle of interest to us is right there that's the triangle that's going to help us uh, find the value of r remember that distance between the point on the terminal side and the origin 0 0 is always uh, um, depicted using the letter r and now for the purpose of computation of r, the location does not matter because we really care about what this distance is, right? Or this length. We know that this length is going to be 12. And we know that this length here, the x-coordinate uh, value, is going to be 5. So now in this right triangle right here, we have the legs being 5 and 12 and the hypotenuse being r. So we have r squared equals 5 squared plus 12 squared. So r squared equals 25 plus 144. So r squared equals 169. So r is either positive or negative um, 13. And because we're dealing with length, we're only going to take the positive case. So r equals 13. Now that we have r, writing the trig functions is going to be very simple. Because as you know, sine of theta will be by definition y over r. And y is negative 12 over r, which we just found to be 13, right? Now, we normally just put the negative on the side of the fraction. Now, cosine of theta is going to be x over r. So that's just going to be the x value or the x coordinate, which is 5 over 13. The tangent of theta is going to be y over x y being negative 12 x being 5 so we get negative 12 over 5 now the next three are going to be very easy to find because if you remember from the definitions let's go back and look at them real quickly see 
each of these is basically just the reciprocal of the one above it, right? So cosecant uh, of an angle is the reciprocal of the sine of the angle. Secant of an angle is the reciprocal of the cosine of the angle. And the cotangent of an angle is the reciprocal of the tangent of the angle. Given that we've computed these already, we could just reciprocate them and get the results. However, just so that we get you know really good at remembering these let's go ahead and do it directly and we can compare and make sure that we've done it correctly anyway as a double check so cosecant by definition is r over y right so it's going to be 13 over negative 12 right as i said we usually put that negative on the side of the fraction like so okay and of course that is the reciprocal of the sine right secant of theta is going to be r over x which is going to be 13 which is r over x which is 5 and cotangent of theta will be x over y which will be 5 over negative 12 which as I said we normally just put the negative on the side of the fraction and write it as negative 12 over 5 why because positive divided by negative is negative so we just get negative 5 over 12 and that's how you do it very simple just need a good sketch and a lot of uh, attention that you have to pay to detail otherwise it's very very simple do indeed notice the reciprocal relationship between sine and cosecant cosine and secant and tangent and cotangent all right here we have more of a conceptual uh, kind of uh, problem and uh, we are giving given a point uh, x y which is in quadrant uh, four, and we want to determine the sine of x over y. There is no real angle involved here, right? We're not dealing with trig functions. This is purely an algebraic question. So uh, if we draw a grid, let me show you. Again, I'll do that using technology so it looks nice. All right, so as you know, this is, um, quadrant one here and basically when you use uh, two axes like this a horizontal axis being called the x-axis and the vertical axis being called the y-axis they break the plane up into four uh, regions uh, we call this region quadrant one the one on the left is quadrant two this one is three and this one is four Notice that we go in a counterclockwise uh, direction uh, to uh, increase the number of the quadrants. And now we are in quadrant four. Notice in quadrant four, the X values are positive and the Y values are negative. So if you want to know the sign of X over Y, you're going to be dividing some positive value by some negative value. And of course, we know that positive divided by negative is negative. So what is the sign of X over Y? It will be negative. You will do a lot of thinking and analysis like this in a trigonometry class. So get very comfortable with that kind of questioning. All right, in our next example, uh, we're given the terminal side of an angle using an equation, a linear equation. So we want to find the exact value of the six trigonometric functions of some angle theta for which um, this equation describes the uh, terminal uh, side. Now this equation would normally represent an entire line, correct? But notice that because of this restriction that we're only going to consider x values that are less than or equal to zero, 
we will chop it down to a ray, which is exactly what we need uh, to form an angle. So let's do a little bit of algebra on that. You have negative 3x plus y equals 0. So you get y equals 3x. Now notice that's a linear equation in slope-intercept form now. In fact, if I put a 0 plus 0 there, you can see it. So remember the slope-intercept form is y equals mx plus b. So here your slope is... 3 which, which you can write as positive 3 over positive 1 and the y-intercept uh, has a y coordinate b which is a 0 therefore the y-intercept itself is 0 0 so uh, if we bring in another grid notice that we're going to start at 0 0 and we're going to go up three and over one now that is one option to give us another point on this line right we can listen to the slope but since i'm going to be interested in x values less than or equal to zero i'm going to get clever here and instead of going positive three over positive one i'm going to go negative three over negative one they're the same thing remember the overall result is positive three right so starting here i'm going to go down three units and then left one unit remember the slope is the change in y which we usually refer to as delta y over the change in x so we have to go down 3 and then the change in x is negative 1 so that's left 1 so now if I draw my array it'll look like that uh, and notice this function uh, has only been defined for x values less than or equal to 0 so this line won't have any presence on this side right so um, let me see if I can do a better job on that All right, so there's our angle. The initial side is, of course, the positive x-axis, and there's the terminal side. And if I want to actually show the angle, that will be the angle right there. And I'm going to um, need a, a point, right, so that I can get my values um, for the trig functions. Any point on the terminal side of the... Uh, angle will do so let me just make a quick table here notice if i just let x be negative one y is going to be three times negative one which is negative three so there's a ordered pair right there which i can use on the terminal side of the angle to now write all my six trigonometric functions uh, I will need to find the value of R so let me show you R will be right there so we know that this length here is 1 we know that the vertical length is 3 right so we're going to form a Pythagorean equation so we have r squared equals 1 squared plus 3 squared so we get r squared equals 1 plus uh, 9 which is 10 so we get r equals positive or negative square root of 10 we only take the positive case because r is always positive okay So now we're ready to write our trig functions. So sine of theta will be y over r, right? So it's going to be the y value, which is, uh, as you can see, negative 3 over 
the R value, which is square root of 10. Now, we always like to simplify fractions in mathematics, right? So we're going to go ahead and rationalize the denominator by multiplying top and bottom by square root of 10. So we get negative 3 square root of 10 over 10. What we just found was the sine of the angle theta. For the cosine of theta, we will um, these touchy laptops. All right, for the cosine of theta, we know it's x over r. Now the x uh, value is negative one, as you can see. Negative one. See the x coordinate. Negative one over r which is square root of 10 once again we will rationalize the denominator and we will get negative square root of 10 over 10 and uh, for the tangent of theta we need y over x which will be negative 3 over negative 1 so we get 3 okay now for the cosecant secant and cotangent we'll just take the reciprocal of these now because we don't want to end up with another uh, radical in the denominator it's better to take the reciprocal of this form rather than this form so we'll go with these and we'll take the reciprocal of those for the first two so for cosecant of theta we're just going to take uh, square root of 10 over negative 3. So it'll be a negative answer and it'll be negative square root of 10 over 3. For the, for the secant of theta, we're going to take the reciprocal of that which is just going to be square root of 10 over negative 1, which is just negative square root of 10. And for the cotangent of theta, we're just going to take the reciprocal of that, which is 1 third. Okay? And that's all there is to it. So, uh, a little bit more involved. You have to remember a little bit more algebra, but once you do, everything rolls pretty smoothly right so you have to make sure that uh, you realize uh, how to uh, you know how to graph those you have to review that in case you need to do so basically speaking the coefficient of x is going to be your slope and b is going to be the y coordinate of the y-intercept remember the x-coordinate of the y-intercept because it's a point on the x uh, on the y-axis is always zero right the x value of any point on the y-axis is zero so that we always know anyway right so this is the one we get from here so we know that the origin is this this particular line goes through the origin and to get another point we listen to the instructions of the slope uh, which uh, in this case were negative 3 over negative 1 so given starting at any point on this uh, particular uh, line I can go down three units and left one unit to get another point that's how we obtained this point and that we, can, we also you know can just visually see it or we could have just used the table plug in negative 1 for x we get 3 times negative 1 is negative 3 so here we have a point on the terminal side of the angle theta and we can use that to write all the different uh, trigonometric functions for theta. All right, so make sure again that you can run through this entire process completely on your own without any assistance before you move forward. Just getting a rough idea of something and then moving on to the next concept is never going to get it done for you. You have to really let your mind absorb some concept before you move to the next one. It does no good to kind of get something and then move on to the next problem. Uh, it's just never going to be the kind of depth that you need to become really good in math. 
So notice none of the angles we've dealt with so far have been quadrantal. Quadrantal angles, of course, are the ones where the terminal side falls on one of the um, axes, the positive x-axis, negative x-axis, positive y-axis, or negative y-axis. So let's see what happens with the quadrantal um, angles and their trigonometric functions. We'll just start by looking at the six trigonometric uh, functions for a 90 degree angle. Okay, so we know that we're looking at an angle theta that looks like so. And that's 90 degrees. So basically, in, if I'm going to be writing the trigonometric functions of that angle, I'm going to need a point on its uh, terminal side. Of course, I know that the initial side is just the positive x-axis. So uh, the terminal side is the positive y-axis. So just any point on the positive y-axis will do. Why don't we take the point... Zero, 01 it's as good as any right now um, remember what r is r is the distance between some point on the terminal side of the angle and uh, the origin which is zero zero so what is this distance from here to here notice the y coordinate here is one and here it's zero so that's just one right and of course, this could have been any point on the y-axis. I could have put, picked zero. Uh, well, I should say on the positive y-axis. I could have picked uh, zero, five, zero, ten. Any of them will work. So here we know that this length here is one, and that's r. Notice that also happens to be the y value, right? And the x value is zero, right? Now we're ready to write all the six trig functions so sine of 90 degrees is going to be y over r now notice y is 1 right and r is also 1 so it's going to be 1 over 1 which is 1 okay cosine of 90 degrees is going to be x over r correct so now we know that the x coordinate at this point is zero so it's going to be zero over one because r is one the r value doesn't change so that's going to be zero the tangent of 90 degrees is going to be y over x right you know that y is 1 and x is 0 so what happens here this is undefined the tangent of 90 degrees is undefined not all these ratios are going to be well defined all the time so now we're ready to write the other three ratios so cosecant of 90 degrees that'll be r over y so it's just going to be the reciprocal of this once again that's just going to be one the secant of 90 degrees is going to be r over x which is one over zero notice that's going to also be undefined Anytime you end up with a zero in the denominator, that's going to be an undefined scenario. And the cotangent of 90 degrees, this one is going to be x over R, uh, y. x over y, so x is zero, y is one. No problem. Zero divided by one is zero. So cotangent is well defined and it's zero. All right, so that's how you handle quadrantal angles. We'll take a look at a few more. All right, see if you can do this on your own definitely before you come back to watch the rest of the video.
All right, so now we're dealing with a 180 degree angle. We know that that's going to look like so, right? So we need some point on the ne on the negative x-axis, which is going to be the terminal side. Remember, the initial side, let me graph that in green. The initial side of this angle is the positive x-axis and the terminal side, which I'll draw in red, is going to be the negative x-axis, right? So we need some point on the terminal side. And of course, you can pick any point, but you know, think about it. What's a really nice simple one? How about negative one, zero, right? So now we can go ahead and determine that R, remember R is the distance between this point negative one zero on the terminal side of the angle and the origin. So of course we know that this distance is just going to be one. So R is one and um, sine of 180 is going to be y over r now remember this is going to be because of the point we have picked that's going to be x that's going to be y in our computations right so y is going to be 0 over r which is 1 and 0 over 1 is 0 no problem that's perfectly well defined the cosine of 180 degrees that's going to be x over r right now the x coordinate here is negative 1 and r which of course stays fixed is 1 so we get negative 1 over 1 which is negative 1 the tangent of 180, that's going to be y over x. So y is 0 and x is negative 1. So 0 over negative 1, so it's 0. That's also well defined. Now cosecant of 180 is going to be r over y which is 1 over 0 which is undefined the secant of 180 is going to be it's of course degrees right we have to really say that degrees when there it's degrees because otherwise it will be interpreted as another measure which is radians and which is very different and we'll discuss very soon So um, the secant is going to be r over x, 1 over negative 1, which is negative 1. And the cotangent of 180 is going to be x over y. The x value is negative 1. The y value is 0. So negative 1 over 0. So that's also undefined. So this, you can see how we handle quadrantal angles. It's very simple, right? The fact is that R actually turns out to be very easy to compute. So that's why these are very easy to compute. The most complex part of the evaluation of these ratios is the computation of R. When R is easy to compute, these values are easy to compute, these uh, function values. All right. Try this one before you come back to the video. All right, so remember that we're trying to sketch a negative 270 degree uh, angle, right? Remember, you always start on the positive x-axis, that's the initial side of the angle, and then you could do the rotation as indicated. Negative rotation means a clockwise rotation, right? So starting and going down, we get to 90 degrees, uh, negative 90 degrees right here negative 180 here and negative 270 will be up there so you have to go all the way to here 
there we have a negative 270 degree uh, angle so we need a, a point on the terminal side remember the terminal side of this angle uh, is the positive y-axis again so we, again we can use say 0 1 so the x is 0 y is 1 and r of course which is this distance between this point on the terminal side and the origin will just be the y value is 1 here 0 here so 1 minus 0 is 1 so r is going to be 1 so again we can write the six trig functions sine of negative 270 degrees cosine of negative 270 degrees and tangent of negative 270 degrees so sine as we now know is y over r so it's going to be 1 over 1 so it's 1 the cosine is going to be x over r so it'll be 0 over 1 which is 0 tangent will be y over x so it's going to be 1 over 0 so it's undefined if it looks extremely familiar that's because it is they're exactly the same values as for 90 in fact we call 90 and negative 270 coterminal angles and because they have the same terminal side and angles that are coterminal are always going to have the same trigonometric function values we'll get to that in much more detail later so moving on to cosecant of theta uh, or in this case we know theta is negative 270 so cosecant of negative 270 degrees that will be r over y so again 1 over 1 which is 1 secant of negative 270s will be r over x which will be 1 over 0 which is undefined of course and the cotangent of negative 270 degrees will be x over y so it will be 0 over 1 which is 0 and there it is make sure you understand that and we'll proceed notice here that here for the sake of practice I got a little carried away we figured out all of these six angles but here they only wanted us to find the cosine of negative 270 degrees so in the next one we'll only do the one that they ask for but this was great for our practice let's do the next one now so here we're going to look at cosecant of negative 630 degrees so remember we're only going to worry about cosecant this time see if you can find the answer before you come back all right so again we start here and for negative 630 degrees you know if we go that's negative this way it's going to be a clockwise rotation so that's negative 90 negative 180 negative 270 negative 360 right now this is going to be going on for a while right so the easiest thing to do is to find the coterminal angle with that which is going to be uh, positive so if we take negative 630 degrees and add uh, two full revolutions to it 720 notice we end up with 90 once again so basically if you you're going to go around once and then again and you're going to stop right there so let me do that again better so that's what the spiral would look like which shows what this angle is right so
So basically it has the same terminal side as 90 which we just looked at. So once again we can use the point 0, 1. That'll be X, that'll be Y. And R, of course, will again be 1. And that's just because I'm picking the point 0, 1. If I had picked the point 0, 5, R would have been 5, right? So uh, it depends on that. All right, so cosecant, we're only going to do what they asked for this time. Cosecant, remember, is, um, well, sine is what? Y over R, so cosecant is R over Y. So it's going to be R, which is 1, over 1, and we get 1. Now remember, when you get a problem like this, it's extremely important that you show that you understand what you're doing. So this is the kind of sketch you're going to need to show me. This is the kind of work you need to show me, because otherwise, Plugging that into a calculator uh, and getting an answer is not worth a whole lot to me, right? So it's good to be able to check in that way, but not to perform in that way, because otherwise you're going to go into your other classes for after this and you're going to be completely lost. If you've taken trigonometry, that means you're a STEM major, right? Of some sort. And if you are going to take other math classes, you're going to need to know what you're doing. The period of, uh, you know, just getting by with uh, preliminary understanding is over for you. You really have to start going for depth and you have to start going for understanding. And that is not going to happen with you just punching away on a calculator, right? Or using some app, etc. All right, so let's proceed. So now we're going to evaluate this more complex um, expression but notice that we're basically going to be dealing with some trig functions of 270 right so let's go ahead and do a sketch of 270 so we know that for a 270 degree angle we start at the you know standard location the positive x direction and we go counterclockwise that's 90 180 270 is right there so there's a 270 degree angle so we're going to need a point on the negative y-axis to help us evaluate the trick functions for a 270 degree angle and of course 0 negative 1 will do just fine and that's going to be the x value that's going to be the y value and this distance from the origin to that point is just going to be 1 because remember the y value here is negative 1 and it's 0 here so that distance is 1 so r remember r is always positive it's a distance x and y can change values be positive negative or 0 but r is always positive all right so so let's go ahead and figure out cotangent of 270 real quickly on the side here as well as the sine of 270 because we'll be needing those. So the sine of 270 degrees, that's going to be y over r. Now we know that y is negative 1, right? So it'll be negative 1 over r is 1. 1, so it's negative 1. And for cotangent, we know that's x over y, right? So um, x is 0 and y is negative 1, so that will be 0, correct? It's well defined, it just happens to be 0. All right, because we don't get a zero in the denominator. That's the only time it becomes undefined. Zero in the numerator is no problem as long as there's not a zero in the denominator. Zero over zero is, of course, undefined as well. All right, so here we're going to get four times the cotangent of 270 degrees, which is zero, minus three times the sine of 270 degrees, which is ne negative 1. 
All right, so we get zero. Negative times negative will make it this a positive. So we get zero plus three. So the evaluated answer is three right there. So that's how you would do a problem like that. All right, for our last example in this video, we're going to look at a couple of important generalizations. Let n be any integer, and remember integers are the set uh, that we represent using the letter z, and uh, they are basically all the whole numbers and their opposites. Okay? And if that's the case, if n is an integer, then n times 90 represent uh, any integer multiple of 90 degrees, right? So that means 1 times 90, 2 times 90, 3 times 90, negative 2 times 90, negative 3 times 90, 0 times 90, any integer multiple of 90. Now, if I want to look at only odd integer multiples of uh, 90, such as, for example, 3 times 90, 5 times 90, or negative 3 times 90, or negative 5 times 90, etc., I'm going to use not n times 90, but rather 2n plus 1. This is the multiple that uh, creates odd uh, uh, multiples for you right here, 2n plus 1. So 2n plus 1 times 90 represent any odd. So try it. Uh, let's, for example, let n be 0, right? That means 2n plus 1 is going to be what? 2 times 0 plus 1, which is 1. See, that's an odd uh, number, which you're going to multiply by 90. Now let n be 1. Then 2n plus 1 is going to be 2 times 1 plus 1, which is what? 3. See? 2n plus 1, when you plug in... Um, integer values for n will always generate an odd number. Uh, try negative ones. Let n be negative 2. So 2n plus 1 will be 2 times negative 2 plus 1. That's negative 4 plus 1, which is negative 3. See? So when you multiply uh, 2n plus 1 by 90 degrees, you're going to get the odd multiples of 90 degrees. So now we want to determine whether the expression cosine of 2n plus 1 times 90 degrees is going to be giving us a value of 0, 1, negative 1, or is it undefined? Well, remember, we're looking at the cosine of odd multiples of 90. That means, for example, what? That means the cosine of, for example, 1 times 90, which is just the cosine of 90, right? or the cosine of 3 times 90, right? Which is what? That's the cosine of 270 degrees. Or say the cosine of negative 1 times 90, which is the cosine of negative 90 degrees or say the cosine of negative 3 times 90 which is the cosine of negative 270 degrees so we're looking at if you observe you're either looking at angles that have a terminal site right there or a terminal site right there so if the terminal site happens to be up here let's just use the point zero one for x and y and if, hap if it happens to be down here let's go ahead and use 0 negative 1 for x and y right notice that in both cases because of the points we've chosen r will be 1 right now let's look at the ones that end up up here let's look at the odd multiples of 90 degrees that end up with a terminal side up here, right? Such as 90 itself or um, 
90 plus 360 would be what 450 that kind of an angle right so if that's the case notice that the cosine is going to be the x value which is zero right what if you look at the ones that end up down here with the ordered pair um, like that though the cosine is x over r but remember zero over one is just going to be what zero right and down here the cosine is uh, also x over r which is going to be zero over one so in both cases whether the terminal side of a odd multiple of 90 degrees happens to be up here the positive y axis or the negative y axis the x coordinate is going to be zero so the cosine which is x over r is always going to be 0 over 1 which is 0 so the choice that we need to pick is 0 okay so this kind of problem really forces you to dig deep and understand what we're dealing with in uh, when, it, when it comes to these ratios so make sure you spend adequate time on this problem to fully understand what we're talking about before you jump and uh, dive into the homework okay all right so uh, that's a great lesson i hope you enjoyed it as much as i did and i will see you uh, for the next one so please uh, make sure that you stay up to date with your assignments stay safe